And so, uh, Psalm 1. Let's give attention now to uh, the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is God's holy word. May He bless our hearts this morning. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This is the... uh, common wish that we say to each other when a new calendar year begins. And it's a good thing to wish this for one another because we were created to be happy and we all long to be happy. Uh, Blaise Pascal, a religious philosopher from the 1600s, once uh, profoundly said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war And the others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step, but to this object, this is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. It's a profound thought, isn't it? That everything we do is for this goal of happiness. We all want happiness. We all want to live happily ever after, don't we? And this is why we say Happy New Year to each other. But as one author put it, no aspect of life is more desired, more elusive, and more perplexing than happiness. And when we come to God's Word, we find that God's original intent for us was to be truly happy, to have a life of abundance and success, to have a life of comfort and security. And because we were created for this sort of life, all men, as Pascal puts it, seek happiness in all that they do. And so the problem then is not the goal of happiness. The problem is the means that men employ for attaining that goal. And ever since Adam sinned in the garden, the train of happiness was derailed along with all of its passengers, all of Adam's descendants whom he represented in the garden, in that covenant of works. And so the tragedy of the fall is that now everyone does what is right in his own eyes, They're blind, they're groping in the dark of this world. They all strive to lay a new track to happiness in this blindness. But all other tracks, except the one which was first laid by God, leads to a cliff of destruction. It leads to perishing, as we see in this psalm. But lest we despair, this psalm, Psalm 1, enters into this tragic narrative of mankind and reveals to us the right track that we need to be on in order to experience life as we were originally intended to. It speaks of the blessed man who lives the abundant life, who's truly happy and always succeeds. Isn't that what we all want? But the reason that he experiences this life is because he's on the right track, namely, he's on the way of the righteous. And the psalm really makes things simple for us. It uh, reduces all of life to just two ways, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. The question then that we are confronted with this morning and at the beginning of this new year is this, what way are we on? What way are you on? Depending on how we answer that question, we'll determine whether or not we will be truly happy in the new year. And not only in the new year, but for all of eternity. And so let's uh, consider this psalm then, and we'll see that the key to a life of happiness is the way of holiness in Christ. The key to a life of happiness is the way of holiness in Christ. We'll see first the life of happiness, and then we'll see the way of holiness, and then in our conclusion, we'll see that Christ is 
the way. He is the way. But first, notice with me in this psalm the life of happiness. Uh, To begin with, we want to consider a little deeper what a life of happiness looks like according to this psalm. And notice in your text there, in 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 God's Word, that the, the psalm opens with that word, blessed. Blessed. This is a key word in the psalm. And the word in Hebrew is ashray. And it's a word that's hard to translate in such a way that it communicates all of its significance in English. But Psalm 1 helps us to better understand this word with two insights. In the first place, notice blessedness is the opposite of perishing. And how do I know this? How do we know this? Well, as you may know, the Psalms are Hebrew poetry, and one of the ways that meaning is communicated is is in the form and the structure of things. So notice then in Psalm 1 that the first word is blessed. And what's the last word? Perish. The terms blessed and perish appear at opposite ends of this psalm. And the psalmist has purposely placed them there to communicate that they are polar opposites. The same exact thing happens in Psalm 112, which elaborates on Psalm 1. In addition to this, there's another feature in the Hebrew that communicates that blessedness is the opposite of perishing. The term blessed, as I said earlier, is the term ashray, and it begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alpha, or aleph, actually. And uh, the term perish is toved. And guess which letter of the Hebrew alphabet toved begins with? The last letter of the alphabet, tav. So blessed and perish are like A and Z. That's how I pronounce it, Z. (laughs) Or A and Z, right? Blessed and perish are like A and Z. They couldn't be any further apart from each other in meaning. And the poetry of Psalm 1 communicates this. Isn't that beautiful? But this is the first insight for us of what blessedness means. It's the opposite of perishing or fading away. And in the second place, we see in the psalm that blessedness is like a tree. Another prominent feature of Hebrew poetry is its use of imagery. And the image that the psalmist gives us here is that of a tree. He is like a tree. What kind of tree? A tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Verse 3. Now, if you were a tree, isn't this the kind of tree that you'd like to be? Of course. But why? Well, because it has all the resources that it needs. It has these streams of water that it's planted next to so that it's always sustained in life. It always finds the sustenance that it needs to live, and it bears fruit. It's, so it's productive. It's productive. It bears fruit in life, and its leaves don't wither, so it has endurance in life. It's not like the sad tree sitting in our house <laughs> that we brought inside a little bit too late and got frostbitten and has uh, got withered leaves now. You don't want to be a tree in our house. You want to be a Psalm 1 tree. You want a life of sustenance, uh, of productivity and endurance. Do you ever feel like your resources are running dry? Perhaps you are exhausted all the time due to work-related stress or anxiety or depression or physical pain. Maybe you aren't sleeping well and eating well, and so you just keep feeling more and more weak and tired, like you're withering away. Or do you ever have the feeling at the end of the day that you got absolutely nothing done that you wanted to get done? You had a list of things to do, maybe 10 things or so. Maybe you got one thing done and uh, you're just so sad and depressed at the end of the day. You didn't get anything done and maybe somebody asked you, what did you do today? Uh, I don't know. I can't even remember what I did. I, you know, you felt like you were unproductive. Uh, like you were, it wasn't a fruitful day in your mind and it was a waste and you're sad about that. Or what about Endurance. You know, how much do we want this? How much do we want our work to really last? The things that we work hard for in life, right? We build our homes. We put a lot of money and work to to buy a home. And uh, it can just be destroyed in a 
natural disaster like we've seen recently in the BC floods, um, right? Or it becomes a money pit, <laughs> right? It breaks down and, and it zaps your savings and then you can't afford it anymore. Or, or you save up to buy a car and you end up getting a lemon. Or, you know, we just bought a bunch of toys for our children for Christmas, right? And, and uh, you know, it's fun for a time, but we know that those toys aren't going to last, right? They're either going to break down, batteries are going to die, the kids might break them, or they're just going to be old news in a month or two. They don't endure. Uh, so much of what we work for doesn't endure. The fruit of our labors doesn't endure forever. And most significantly, we don't endure Death comes for us all. We all perish and have no more share in this life under the sun, as Ecclesiastes 9 puts it. And these are the effects of a sin-cursed world that has been frustrated by the fall. But Psalm 1 offers us hope in this tree that flourishes and the blessedness of not perishing. What does it mean to be blessed? To be blessed is to be truly happy. That would be a wonderful translation, to be truly happy in the sense of a, a state of total well-being, contentment, and joy. The Psalms elaborate on this idea of blessedness. It includes well-being in family life, well-being in finances, well-being in spiritual life, well-being in emotions, and well-being in body, and more. It's a state of optimal life, of total well-being, with the attendant feelings of joy and satisfaction, this is the blessedness that God created us for in the Garden of Eden, symbolized in the tree of life. This is the true happiness that we all long for. It's the first word of Psalm 1, and it's the opening theme of the Psalms as a whole. You can see then why this is a fitting psalm for us to meditate at the beginning of a new year. How can you have a truly happy new year? The answer is here in Psalm 1. Furthermore, God created us to prosper. And we see this at the center of the psalm, at the end of verse 3. It says, in all that he does, he prospers. As I mentioned, the, the form of Hebrew poetry communicates meaning. And often that comes in the form of what we call a chiasm. If you recall from previous sermons, a chiasm is just like a pyramid, a stepped pyramid. And the outer parts of the pyramid correspond together. And as you move towards the middle, often the middle is the point, the main theme. And uh, without going into all the details and proving this chiastic structure, you just have to trust me, uh, what is at the, the center of this chiasm, at the top of the pyramid, at the middle, the heart of the psalm, notice verse 3, in all that he does, he prospers. Not so the wicked. That's the heart of the psalm. In all that he does, the blessed man, and all that he does, he prospers. Not so. The Hebrew is emphatic there. The first words are not so. Not so the wicked. This is the central contrast of the psalm and the main point. The blessed man, who is also the righteous man, prospers. He succeeds in all that he does. And this too is another aspect of blessedness or the truly happy life. It involves success. And who here doesn't want to succeed? We all want to succeed in our jobs, right? We want that job promotion, that pay raise, that employee of the month award. We want success in our relationships. We want friendships that last. We want a family that gets along. We want good kids that respect us and do well in school. We want success in sports and competition, none of this participation trophy stuff. We want success. We want to look successful when we go to our high school reunions, don't we? We don't want people to say, whoa, what in the world happened to him or her? Wasn't she the prom queen? <laughs> Wasn't he the homecoming king? Look at him or her now. Divorced, gained weight, low-paying job, doesn't own a home yet, no kids. We all want success in life. And the glorious promise of Psalm 1 is that the one who is blessed is not just likely to succeed. Rather, notice he will succeed, and not just in some things, but in everything he does. He's truly happy. He's the most successful man that has ever lived. In all that he does, he prospers. Not so the wicked. 
And notice, what are the wicked like in this psalm? Well, the wicked are like chaff. What is chaff? Well, children, chaff is the outer protective casings of a, of a grain such as a wheat. And in the days of Israel, at the end of harvest, the farmers would, would take their wheat to what was called a threshing floor. And these threshing floors were usually at the top of a hill uh, where there was a good wind. And, and what they would do is have an animal or some other instrument drawn over the wheat in order to, to crush out the edible grains of wheat. And then they would take the grains of wheat in the chaff and they would throw them up in the air. The wind would then blow the chaff away while the heavier grain would just fall to the ground. So the wheat would then be collected for food while the chaff would just be scattered or burned. And so this is what the psalmist says the wicked are like. They are like chaff which is good for nothing and vanishes. They are the very opposite of the blessed man who is productive and endures. They are fruitless and they fade away. In verse 5, we read that the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. That's to say that the Lord is intimately acquainted with and loves the way of the righteous. And He knows their destiny. And He protects them and brings them to that destination. At the final judgment, He acknowledges them as His people. But what happens to the wicked? How does this psalm end? But the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked is a life that amounts to nothing in the end. And so we have to ask, and I think it's obvious answer, which life is the best life between the two? Well, it's the life of the blessed man, the one who experiences the things that we deeply long for in this life, the life that we were originally created to enjoy. The question then is, how can we experience this life of happiness after the fall? We'll notice that the key to a life of happiness is, secondly, the way of holiness. The way of holiness. You see, not only were we created to be happy, we were created to be holy. And these two things, happiness and holiness, they go hand in hand. Uh, there's a, a children's catechism based on the Westminster Shorter Catechism that we use in our family, and some of you parents, I think, use it as well. You know, it starts with the question, who made you? And the answer is God. What else did God make? All things. Well, if you go forward in that children's catechism, it asks the children, in what condition did God originally create Adam and Eve? And the answer is holy and happy. Holy and happy, because these two things go hand in hand. And we know that when Adam sinned, he became unholy and as a result, unhappy. So holiness and happy, they go hand in hand. Holiness is the key to happiness. You know, maybe you've heard the saying, happy wife, happy life. Well, the biblical saying that should be our motto is holy life, happy life. And what then does a life of holiness look like? Well, it's simply a life lived in keeping with God's instructions in His holy word. And according to the opening verse of Psalm 1, it means two things. It means we avoid the wrong advice and we absorb the right advice. We avoid the wrong advice and we absorb the right advice. Notice first we, we avoid. Verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So the life of happiness is experienced in part by what we avoid. And notice how there's this gradual downward spiral here in this verse. First from walking alongside the wicked to standing in their counsel and then sitting in their presence and becoming one of them. Uh, in his famous book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis characterizes the road to hell as a gradual decline rather than a cliff face. And that's how the psalmist characterizes the path of apostasy that leads to perishing here. It's this gradual decline. It's a gradual decline. Nobody just wakes up and decides, you know what, today I'm going to be an apostate. 
I'm going to deny Christ. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to just commit adultery. Nobody wakes up one day and just says, I'm going to murder somebody. It all starts with little compromises with sin and, and subtle giving in to the temptations of the world and, and taking counsel from the wicked. But it's a downward spiral that, that leads ultimately to perishing. And so as those who want to be happy in life, we have to separate ourselves from and avoid the way of the wicked, even the little compromises we are tempted to make. A a little white lie, just a little lust, just harboring a little resentment and bitterness towards someone, just a, a little disrespect for authority. But there are no little sins, and sin always wants more. So we must avoid the way of the wicked. And by avoid, I don't mean that we should all become like monks or like Hutterites. Uh, Martin Luther once said, you know, I tried to be a monk but my, uh, and go into a closet basically, and, but my sin followed me there. Uh, Jesus said, be in the world but not of it. And so this means then that we will inevitably be exposed to a certain amount of negative influences every day. We encounter them in the grocery store, we encounter them on billboards, on the television, on the radio, on podcasts, on the internet, and the list could go on and on. We are always bombarded with the way of the wicked, but when those moments come where the way of the wicked seeks to draw you in with its lies, you need to remember the message of Psalm 1. The way of the wicked is a downward spiral that amounts to nothing. They think it's the good life, it's portrayed as as the good life. Of course, right? Because Satan always shows the bait but hides the hook, as one Puritan once put it. God's Word tells us the truth. It tells us what's really going on. And sometimes it speaks in shocking ways like smelling salts to wake us up, to shock us out of sin and back on the way of the righteous. And it does this because the world never tells you the truth about the consequences of sinful behaviors and attitudes. The world makes sin look pleasing to the eye as Satan did in the garden. It entices you like uh, the sirens in Homer's Odyssey who lured nearby sailors with their enchanting music and voices to shipwreck on the rocky coast of their island. Have you noticed that casinos, they never advertise all of the lives that have been ruined due to a gambling addiction? The pornography industry never tells you about all of the marriages and families that have been destroyed because of it? of all the human trafficking and slavery that goes on because of it. The advocates of abortion don't speak about the murder of innocent babies. They speak about the rights of a woman to choose. Well, Psalm 1 exhorts us not to yield to the wicked influences of the world, to see through the lies. Now, it would be an oversimplification to say that the the counsel of the wicked refers only to the advice of non-Christians. This is too simplistic because often we find that the wicked in the Psalms are people who are members of the covenant community. And furthermore, it's too simplistic because by God's common grace, non-Christians can and do give good advice of some things. And so as one commentator put it, avoiding negative influence is a matter of discerning the truth of divine principles no matter what the source And so we're to be in the world and not of the world. We're to engage in the culture with wisdom and discernment, avoiding walking in the wicked advice and the sinful behaviors of the world. Now, how can we grow in that and mature in this? Well, the primary way that we gain this sort of discernment according to Psalm 1 is by delighting in and meditating on God's Word. So we're to avoid the wrong advice and we're to absorb the right advice. Right? It's like, how they used to say that, I don't know if this happens today, but I've heard once that, you know, it's how do you spot a counterfeit bill? It's by studying the real thing, right? Meditating on God's Word. Notice verse 2, but His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, what is the law of the Lord? Well, here the psalmist isn't merely speaking of commandments or rules, as we might commonly think of when we hear the word law. Uh, The word for law in verse 2 is Torah. And Torah is a word that is much broader than commandments or rules. It includes them, but it's much broader than that. It means teaching or instruction. 
So what the psalmist is more literally saying is that the blessed man delights in the instruction of the Lord and on his instruction he meditates day and night. You see, holiness begins with study or meditation. Those who are truly happy study and meditate on God's word. But how often does the truly happy man meditate on God's word? Just on Sundays? Once or twice a week? For five minutes each day? No, notice the the truly happy man of Psalm 1 meditates on God's word day and night. Now, this doesn't just mean once in the morning and once in the evening. The psalmist uses what we call a merism, which is speaking of two extremes to include everything in between. So if I said to you, I've been working day and night, you're not going to think that that means I worked, you know, like an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening, right? It means I've been like working like a dog. I'm constantly working. So what the psalmist is really saying is that the blessed man delights in and meditates on God's word throughout the day and night. In other words, it's the atmosphere that he breathes. It's the firm foundation that he always walks on. As Deuteronomy 6 puts it, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. It's like the opposite of the wicked man in Psalm 1, right? God's Word is to be ever on our minds and our hearts. And so let us read it, let us meditate on it, let us memorize it, let us sing it, let us listen to it read, let us listen to it sung, and especially let us hear it preached on Sundays. And the more we meditate on it throughout the day and throughout the week, the more this just comes natural to everyday living. And we will be equipped for discerning the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And as we walk on the way of the righteous or holiness, we'll truly know happiness because we'll be living our lives according to our Creator's good design. He made us and He knows what's best for us, just like a parent knows what's best for their little children. Children are, you know, they tend to gravitate towards things that are dangerous. You know, a hot stove, look at that flame. Oh, flame, right? I gotta touch it, right? No! Ah, right? They think that we're preventing them from the good life. No, that's not the good life, touching hot stoves. Parents know what's best. In the same way, God is our creator. He knows what's best for us. And so let us resolve uh, this year to continue to meditate on God's Word day and night in private worship, family worship, and public worship. And as we live life before the face of God every day, The Bible is where we find our Creator's good and wise instructions for how to know true happiness. And so it ought to be more precious to us than than gold and sweeter than honey from the honeycomb, as Psalm 19 puts it. Let us not read it begrudgingly. Let us not come to church on Sunday as if it's a burden. Let us, as the psalm says, delight to meditate on God's Word day and night like the truly happy man of Psalm 1. And don't just read it. We see here that we're to meditate on it. Now, the Hebrew word meditate has the idea of muttering. It's a word that's often used for the low animal sounds, like the cooing of a dove. Children, have you heard a dove coo? And uh, maybe you've heard a lion growl. I don't know. Have you been to the zoo? Or maybe on YouTube, you've heard a lion growl. It's, this word here is has the idea of muttering. It's a word used for low animal sounds. It's kind of like when an actor mutters lines that he's trying to memorize. And so the idea here is that we are to read God's Word slowly and deeply, even mutter them and and meditate on them. And so let it permeate your heart and your mind. Why? Because this is what the truly happy man does, the one who is like a tree that flourishes forever and succeeds at everything. And so we see here that the key to a life of happiness is the way of holiness. And the way of holiness means avoiding the wrong advice and absorbing the right advice from God's Word and walking in accordance with that Word. As Joshua exhorted Israel in Joshua 1, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. 
for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. But while we all long for a life of happiness, who here can truly claim to be the blessed man of Psalm 1? Who among us never walks in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners? Who here is that blessed man whose attitude is one of perfect delight in God's Word and who meditates on it continually? Furthermore, the Apostle Paul says that there is no one righteous, no, not one, in Romans 3. So then, is there such a man or woman who has ever lived that can claim this psalm is about them? Well, beloved, thanks be to God that there is a man who perfectly was this blessed man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And remember what he said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus never once submitted to the counsel of the wicked. When he was in the wilderness, tempted by Satan, he saw through the lies and avoided the wrong advice. And he did so with the instruction of God as he quoted the Word of God from Deuteronomy. Jesus delighted in and meditated on God's Word so that he might discern the way of the wicked from the way of the righteous. And although he was tempted in every way as we are, he never once sinned. It was always his delight to do his Father's will, and he humbly submitted to it even to the point of death, death on a cross. You see, Psalm 1 speaks of only one way that leads to a life of happiness, and it's the way of holiness. And if Jesus had not come, we all would have perished in the way of wickedness, because we've all, like sheep, gone astray. Each of us has turned our own ways apart from Christ and sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is that Jesus came not to call the righteous, rather He came to save sinners like you and me. And thanks be to God that Psalm 32 also speaks of the blessed man as well. And who is the blessed man of Psalm 32? Well, it's the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And the way that we can be forgiven and receive Christ's righteousness and The abundant life that He earned is by grace alone, through faith alone, in His finished work alone. 1 Peter 3 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And so you see, you can have the life that you've always longed for, the life that you were created for, but it is only if you are united with Jesus Christ through faith. You see, this psalm is ultimately about Jesus. And Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it, what? Abundantly. He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You will amount to nothing. You will perish like the end of the psalm. But abide in me, and you will bear what? Much fruit, like the tree of Psalm 1. It's the fruit that comes by the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is the key to a life of permanent happiness because the way of perfect holiness is found only in Him. He is the blessed man of Psalm 1. And while Psalm 1 speaks of the blessing that falls upon the blessed man, Psalm 2 ends with the blessing that falls upon all who take refuge in the Messiah. Psalm 2 ends by saying, Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. And so take refuge in Jesus this day. He is the righteous man of Psalm 1 in whom there is forgiveness of sins and who earns the life of true happiness for you and me. In Christ, we are blessed, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The truly happy life of Psalm 1 is your eternal inheritance in Christ that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, waiting to be fully revealed when Christ returns. And if you've trusted in Christ, Psalm 1 then is also about who you are in Christ. Blessed is a new man or a new woman in Christ. And I'll live out of your identity in Christ. Walk by faith in Him. Walk in gratitude for Him. And delight in and meditate on God's Word daily. Because as you meditate on God's Word and behold Christ in God's Word, the Holy Spirit promises to transform you more and more into His image and to produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. He promises to give you a foretaste of the eternal happiness that is yours in Christ, no matter what sufferings or setbacks you face in this life. And so how can you have a truly happy new year? By continuing to abide in Christ, the blessed man of Psalm 1, by continuing to feed on Him by faith in God's Word, and by continuing to live out of your union with Him by the Spirit, walking in His ways. And may the Spirit produce much of His fruit in your life this year for the glory of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. It is food for our souls and nourishment. It is sweeter than honey from the comb. It is more precious than gold or silver. We thank You for Your Word, which gives us life as we behold Christ in the Gospel and Your Spirit makes us new in Him, gives us new life in Him, and and saves us from all of our sins and misery. We thank You for Jesus, that He walked on the way that we have so often failed to walk on, that He did it perfectly all the way to the cross to pay off all of our sins and to earn for us the righteousness that we need to inherit this wonderful, beautiful, good life portrayed in this psalm. We thank You that it's ours in Christ through faith. And Father, help us then by Your Holy Spirit to walk more and more in this newness of life, uh, to continue to follow Christ and to walk in faith in Him and and to walk in gratitude. Help us to meditate on Your Word day and night and to, to live the life that we were designed to live. For You are our Creator. We are Your creatures. You are a good shepherd. We are the sheep of Your pasture. And so help us to trust you and to walk in your ways. And we, we thank you that we are secure in the salvation by your Spirit. And we look forward to the day we'll see Christ face to face. And we will uh, have the right then to eat of the tree of life. We'll, we'll know this abundant life in its consummate fullness and all of its eternal happiness and joy. And we look forward to that day. And we pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.